Hello, our friends, evolutionary hearts home family. <laughs> Hello there, welcome back. We're we're a little bit off today, but we have a very special show in front of us. So um, we have a lot of things to share. We're just extra excited. So m just things are interesting. Yeah, very much so. And and she's laughing because we have with us Dawn, who's going to share her story. Uh, of her experience, a uh, NDE experience, and I was talking to Dawn, so I had in my left hand the phone, and I automatically started to do the intro into the phone <laughs> instead of into the microphone. <laughs> yeah, so, so without further ado, we want to introduce Dawn, and she's going to talk a little bit about her herself, her story, her NDE, um, her background and we're just going to kind of go in, and talk with each other and have a conversation because I think she's somebody that should be heard. Um, we've worked on her a, a few times at dinner chart and she's become a close friend. Um, someone who, you know, just reaches out every now and then to say, hey, and we have special stories together, like the timing when she does reach out has been helpful <laughs> for me to say the least. So we, we were doing a, uh, a session not too long ago, and she had this story of her NDE, and it was so touching. And, and I have to tell you, just even now, talking about it now, I keep being brought to tears. And it's, it's something I thought, this needs to be shared. So, um, so I want to introduce you to Don. Hi, Don. Hi, Cindy and Mike. Thank you so much for having me inviting me to share my story um it's very special and I, I i'm so appreciative thank you so much so um well let me just start by saying this happened back in 1987 so it's been a while i was 28 at the time and um yeah, it was it, it was super unique, um, something I never ever thought that I would I would ever experience. But I was a young mom in '87. I had my first two children. Uh, my daughter was three. My my son was four. And after their birth, I started having a lot of very strange issues, health issues. I was having panic attacks that were really bad. It was the, the kind of panic attacks where you, you, you almost feel like you're going to lose consciousness. Hyperventilation, um, it felt like I was going to pass out. And I'm like, gosh, what is wrong with me? I've never had anything like that in my life. Um, and I started to develop an irregular heartbeat. And it scared me. And so I was in this position of trying to deal with this. And this all started about a year after my daughter was born. So I'd been dealing with it for a good two years by the time leading up to when this ND happened. And I was in a place where I, I was so anxiety ridden and so panicky that I couldn't even drive a car some days. I just couldn't even get to the grocery store. And it was, it was just devastating. And on top of that, I have had a failed root canal. They don't tell you that these things can fail, but they can. And what happened in my particular case is the endodontist had punctured the end of the root. It was an upper molar on the left side, and he ended up perforating the root, and the infection and all of that was in this tooth went into my left maxillary sinus. And I had been dealing with a horrific sinus infection for about 10 months and they had had me on just about every antibiotic possible I would go through the course of the antibiotic and then within a couple of weeks it would come back and so I was had been really sick with this and finally they said oh well you need to see a surgeon because there's a problem something's wrong and she did x-rays and she did all the things necessary to determine that I had a bad infection, I already knew that, but she said, your sinus passage is so narrow that it's not going to clear up. It's just not going to happen because it's too narrow, there's no drainage, there's no airflow, on and on. You need surgery. And I was scared. When she said surgery, I, I thought, oh, 
I have children. I have little kids. I'm only 28 years old. I know. I don't want to do so. She goes, well, it's not going to clear up. And so she convinced me this is what needs to happen. And so I, the whole thing, the whole thought of it was, was overwhelming. In addition to the anxiety and the, all the panic and everything I was going through anyway, which actually has its roots in a thyroid issue that was undiagnosed for another 20 years after that, but that's another story. Um, so I end up getting scheduled for this surgery, and just before all of this sinus stuff happened, I had ended up reaching out to a church in our neighborhood because I was thinking, well, wow, you know, how am I going to navigate this? What's happening to me? What's going on in all of this, right? Um, and so I thought, well, you know, maybe it's the whole spiritual thing. Maybe, you know, there's something I should be doing in my life. I came out of a Catholic church. I went to Catholic school from first through eighth grade. We were taught by the nuns and priests. And by the time I ended up graduating high school, I went to a public high school, but everybody in my family was Catholic and, you know, it was expected you do the Catholic thing, right? And so I'm thinking, well, maybe I need to go back to that. But I thought, I'm not going back to the Catholic Church. There's no way. There is just no way. I was so traumatized by everything I learned from the nuns and priests that I thought that there is no way I'm going back. So I ended up finding this, it was a brochure in the mailbox for this non-denominational church that was in our neighborhood. It was a few blocks away. I could actually get to it in a car and not have to get on the freeway. And so I reached out to them. And I said, you know, hey, they had a women's Bible study that was advertised in this brochure. And so I I reached out. I said, hey, I want to be a part of your study. You know, I came out of the Catholic Church, went to Catholic school my whole life. Oh, they were they were more than happy. They were more than happy to have me there. So, anyway, I started attending, and it was different than I had ever known. They're saying, oh, you know, uh, God is loving and cares about you. It was a completely different perspective than I had had while I was in the Catholic Church or in Catholic school. And so it it bothered me a little bit that they wanted to say, well, this is the only way. I'm like, well, wait a minute. The Catholics said it was the only way. So now you're saying that this, I don't get it. And I knew that the Catholic Bible had the Apocrypha in it. It had the extra books that the Protestant religions didn't recognize. And so I was, I was confused. They were like, oh, well, no, you know, they, they had all the explanations and everything. And because of what I was physically dealing with this anxiety, the irregular heartbeats that I was having, and, you know, now this horrible sinus infection, I'm facing this surgery. It was like I needed something to hold on to. And so... They said, oh, you know, God is always there for you. And, you know, they led me in a confession of faith prayer, the Bible study leader. And and so I, even, even though I would bring up to her things that seemed very similar to Catholicism and the rules and the regulations and all that kind of stuff, I was thinking, well, you know what, maybe... Maybe I just missed all this, and this is really what I'm supposed to do. And so I went ahead, and I became a Christian. I prayed the Confession of Faith prayer, and I just believed wholeheartedly, okay, this is it, jumping in both feet, this is where I'm at. And so when it came close to this time that I'm going in for this surgery, I'm thinking, okay, well, I'm going to pray, because I'm scared that I'm going to, die on the table i actually had an aunt that died in a dentist chair she went in for i don't even know what kind of procedure but she didn't have general anesthesia she had some form of anesthesia and she died she had an allergic reaction and she passed away right in chair and so 
I'm thinking about this, and that fueled more anxiety. So I'm thinking, okay, everybody's told me, just pray to God, ask him for whatever you need to ask for, and he's there for you. So I make this prayer. I said, I need to be comforted. I am scared to death of, of having this surgery. I'm afraid of the anesthesia. I am doubly afraid of what's going to happen to my young children if I did die on the table. Who's going to take care of them? And then I was also fearful, am I going to end up in hell? Like <laughs> like what the Catholics would say or, you know, purgatory until enough people have prayed for me to get me out of purgatory. I didn't know. I, I was totally, you know, just running on pure anxiety. And so that was my specific prayer. I wanted to be comforted knowing that my children would, would be fine no matter what happened and that I would be comforted knowing that I could go into the surgery and do what needed to be done and get my health back. So I did that, and then I just kind of put it to rest and figured, okay, I've done what I need to do. And I'm on the winning team now, right? So everything should be cool. So I, I, the day of the surgery arrives, I get to the hospital, and they get me prepped. And I'm in, I'm in the, the surgical room, and it's like those places are scary. They just are. And I'm there, and the anesthesiologist, he's great, and he tells me, you know, you're fine. They gave me a little bit of a, a sedative to calm me down, so I was pretty anxious. And, um, and then he tells me, he said, okay, you know, I want you to start counting backwards. And I think I got to like 98, and that was it. And then I was out. And it was, I don't know exactly at what point, I just remember being in a tunnel. And it wasn't like a black tunnel, it wasn't scary, it wasn't, um, it wasn't anything frightening at all. It was just kind of a dark tunnel, but I was moving through it, and I could see light at the end of the tunnel, and I'm like, oh, that's cool, you know, I wasn't afraid. And I kept moving towards the light, and as I got closer, I realized, oh my gosh, this is extremely bright. I mean, brighter than anything I have ever seen. And so I get to the end of the tunnel, and I step through this, I don't know, doorway? It wasn't a door, but it was like the opening in, from the tunnel into this beautiful feel this it was just it was breathtaking and I stepped through it and the light was was so bright I mean, we don't have light like that on the earth we, we don't we the brightest most sunny day can't even come close to to the light that was there but it didn't hurt the eyes it wasn't this huge radiating heat it was just pure energy light and it was so bright so I stepped through and there's a man there and I knew immediately that it was Yeshua it was Jesus and I'm and I looked at him and I kind of smiled and I'm like and I didn't say this verbally this was mental this was a telepathy kind of exchange and I said oh my gosh it's you and he smiled and responded telepathically by saying, I am whoever anybody needs to see. That's who I am. And I'm like, wow, that is so cool. And I knew in that instant that he was meeting me where I was at the time. There was no rules. There was no, oh, you need to believe this. You need to believe this. You need to believe No. It was, it was just, I am meeting you where you're at. And that's where I was at at the time. And so we started walking. We started strolling through this field. There were trees in the background. I mean, it, and it was more real than anything on earth. I have not seen anything on this planet. I'm 63, almost 66 years old. And I have not seen anything more real than what I was seeing on the other side. And I was just astounded. And it was beautiful. I mean, there are colors. We don't have them here. 
and I can't even describe them. I can't really remember them because we don't see them in we don't see them in this realm. We don't see that. And so we're walking, and I'm, I'm trying to absorb the fact that I'm talking to Yeshua, and I'm like, this is crazy. I can't believe this. And it was all telepathic. And then at one point, I stopped because I had a question. And so when I stopped, he immediately stopped, and he looked me right in the face. And I said to him verbally, I verbalized these words, and I said, how do you do a life? How does that happen? And he smiled and started chuckling, and it was, it was, he was just so exuberant, and his his entire being was an average person, by the way, average looks, but his his countenance, his expressiveness, his warmth, his smile, his eyes—it was just absolutely incredible. And he starts chuckling, and he brings his hands up in front of his chest, and then he spreads them out in a horizontal arc to his sides. And while he does that, he says, it's so simple. And then he does this gesture. And in that microsecond, any question my mind could ever conceive, I have the answer. It all made sense. Everything was in perfect order. Everything made sense. And it was incredibly simple. It was so simple. And so while he's watching my face come to this realization that I have answers to anything I've ever wondered in my life, he starts, he starts laughing, he starts giggling, and pretty soon I'm laughing and giggling. And we're literally having this, this moment of unbelievable joy and expression that it, it is this simple. It really is this simple. And I remember thinking, how do we not know this on the other side? We don't. We don't know it. And so we have this, this beautiful laugh and this chuckling and his facial expressions are so warm and so loving and so content. Everything is content, at peace, wrapped in love, joyful, happy. It was, it was unbelievable, absolutely unbelievable. And so we continue walking. And when I say that he, his, his person, his, the, this body that I'm looking at that's him is average. There's nothing extraordinary. I mean, he's, he's an average guy, average height, average weight, did not have long hair. His hair was not short, short, but it was, you know, it was average length, um, dark. His hair was dark. His complexion was somewhat dark. He had a short, dark beard. He had green eyes, which is, I found that very curious because I had green eyes. And so I'm looking at his eyes. It's like, you kind of look like me a little bit in the eye department. And, but, but it, all in all, he, he was an average guy. But his smile and what it actually exuded from him was more profound than all the people I've ever met in my life. It was just, it was, I can't even, it's beyond words. I can't describe it. And so we walk a little further and he's now using my life as an example to explain details from an eternal perspective and it was very fascinating and i was like oh my gosh that's right you know it's like everything just was just gelling and made so much sense and i'm still just looking at him like this is so simple i can't believe we don't know this and so after a short time he stops and it's and, and he telepathically lets me know it's time to go back and I and for a, a brief moment, I, I thought, I don't want it. No way. I don't want to go back. And then I thought, no, wait a minute. I need to go back. I have to be there for my children. 
And so all of a sudden there's the, you know, there's this opening to this, this tunnel is right there. And telepathically he said, no, no, no worries. Just go ahead and go back. And so I start traversing this tunnel, right? And the first thing that comes back is my hearing. I can't see anything. I can't feel my body, but my hearing is back. And I can hear the nurses talking. And uh, apparently I'm in the recovery room. And I can hear this one nurse that she's she's standing next to me. I can I can tell that she's somewhere close to my body. And she's saying, I don't understand what's wrong. She has good vitals. I don't know what's wrong. I don't know what's wrong. And I and I was and I wanted to say, I'm here, I'm right here. And um, but I couldn't. I couldn't. I couldn't do anything, but I could hear them. And then the other nurse that was in the room, she was, she was, course, you know, she was talking back and back and forth with this other nurse. And apparently what should have been, you know, a 15 to 20 minute wake up from the anesthesia had lapsed into many hours and they didn't know why I was totally unresponsive. And so then I went a little further in the tunnel and I ended up getting my eyesight back. And not that my eyes were open, but I could tell from that I was in a brightly lit room and I could see, you know, red through my eyelids. And I'm like, okay, I, my, my hearing's back, my eyesight's back, but I couldn't feel anything. And I went a little bit further and I started to get into my body. And the first thing that hit me was the pain from the surgery and I thought oh my gosh I can't do this it was it was so blinding the pain and I and I wanted to back up and I thought I'm gonna back up I'm gonna go back I'm gonna go back with Yeshua I can't be here and he prevented me from doing that and he didn't allow me to come back he kind of it's not like I felt his hand on my back but in a you know in a cosmic sense that's sort of what it felt like and he's like, no, you can, you can do this. Go ahead, go on, go on. And so finally, I went a little bit further, and it's like I slammed into my body with like a really hard thud. And then all of a sudden, I was confined. I was in the body, and it was very confining. And I opened my eyes at that point, and the nurse, she's looking down at me. She goes, oh, my gosh, there you are. Thank God, there you are. And I said, am I on earth? And she looked at me and she's like, uh, yeah, you're on, where would you be? You're on, of course you're on earth. And I said, I wasn't here. And she said, yeah, we know that you're, you know, you're, you were gone for a very long time. And I said, oh my gosh, I'm in so much pain. And so then she yells at the southern nurse, can we get some pain medication? And, and I said, I have all the answers. I told her I have all the answers and she said sure you do yeah you do you have them all and I said I I'm not joking I really do I said but I my gosh I'm hurting so bad and so they gave me some pain medication they had a, a towel on my face because I was still bleeding from the sinuses and and it would that part was miserable and they finally got me to where there was a little bit of pain medication on board and I was able to to deal with the pain and they said well you're going to stay in recovery a little bit longer because we don't know what happened why you were totally unresponsive but you were and I'm like okay and so they left me alone for a minute to just kind of decompress from the surgery I guess and I start looking around and, and I don't know if you've ever been in a recovery room from surgery but they're very brightly lit there's a lot of overhead lights the nurses are, you know, it's a busy area. They're constantly checking on people, making sure they're coming out of the anesthesia okay and this and that. And so I'm looking around at this point, and I realize that we actually live in a realm that has zero clarity at all. Everything is murky and foggy. It's... And it just, it crushed me when I, when I actually saw the world that we navigate and live in daily in our bodies, 
there is no clarity at all. We, we are blind. We are walking blindly. And it reminded me of that scripture in the Bible that says, you know, we walk by faith and not by sight. Well, there is a lot of truth to that because we can't see clearly on this side, not with, not with our physical eyes. It just doesn't happen. And so I'm looking at this and I'm like, I'm kind of crushed. I'm like, oh my gosh, I can't believe we live here. And so they get me, they get me stabilized and they get me back to a room. I'm spending the night in the hospital. And now that the pain medication is kicked in, I'm, I can't take pain medication, uh, hardly any of it. It's, it just it upsets my stomach to the point where if I start vomiting, I can't stop. And then I'm dehydrated, and it's miserable. And, and so that's where I was at this point. I'm back to the room. I'm nauseous. I'm vomiting, and I'm just miserable. And they want to give me more pain medication. I'm saying, no, I can't. I can't do the vomiting. It's, and it was, it was horrible. Um, but I was, I was so tired and so spent from the surgery that I did eventually fall asleep. And when I did, I had the same experience. I left my body, I left my eyesight behind, and I left my hearing behind, and I navigated the tunnel, walked to the end, stepped through it, and Yeshua's right there. And I'm like, oh my gosh, we're gonna do this again. And it, we picked up right where we left off. It was like we had momentarily hit pause. And now that I'm back, we resume walking and we, we continue on. And I'm like, oh my gosh, this is, this is incredible. And so after, after communing for a while telepathically, I end up, navigating back through the tunnel and arrive back in my body just like I had I had done before and hearing came first then eyesight and then with a jolt I'm back in my body and can feel it I'm like whoa that was really strange and so now I'm a little bit concerned it's like what is going on with me what what is what is happening but that day it was now morning And it was my time to go home. I'm supposed to go home this day, and so I do. And when I get home, it's just, it's just so difficult to navigate the pain and the nausea from the, from the surgery. And my kids, you know, they've missed me, obviously. And, you know, just taking care of them and trying to get enough rest and so on and so forth. It was very, very difficult, very difficult. And so when I got home, I ended up taking a nap. I ended up laying down for a little bit, was able to sleep, had the same exact experience. And I was like, oh my gosh, what is this? So I'm, I'm back in this beautiful, this beautiful field, we're walking, and he continues to elaborate on my life from the eternal perspective. And we end up in an area where there were a lot of extra, a lot of extra people, beings. I got the sense that they were not departed loved ones. I got the sense that they were either guides or um, angels or ascended masters. They were, they they were. They were those on the other side that are there for us. And they were kind of in a, I don't know, semi-circle. And there was this board. It almost looked like a, a billboard, but it wasn't large. It was, you know, not much taller than I than I am. And and on this board was, was a grid of some sort. It reminded me of an Excel spreadsheet. And, and I, I do accounting you know, for, for a living that that's what pays the bills. But, um, I'm looking at this board and I'm like, this is really curious. What is this? And Yeshua tells me, he said, you need to pick a number. And I'm like, really? And he's like, yeah, pick a number. 
And so I'm looking at this board, and for the life of me, I can't remember what it looks like. I just remember that it looks similar to an Excel spreadsheet, and it had numbers on it. And what the configuration of those numbers are, I, I don't remember. And I remember looking around, and I'm seeing all these other beings here. I couldn't see their faces. Um, that was something, because they were just, they were in the periphery, but they were there. And whatever number I was picking was very important to them. And, and I don't know why, but I know that it was important to them, and they had a vested interest. And so I'm looking around. I see the number five, but it's a little fuzzy, and I'm like, mm, that's not, no, that's not it. And then I see the number nine. I'm like, that's it. That's my number. I, it's nine. And I told Jesus, I told Yeshua, I said, nine, nine's the number. And he broke into the, the big, vibrant smile and was like, that is the best choice you can make. And apparently everybody else that was in the periphery, they were very happy as well. And then it was time for me to go back. So I, I traversed the tunnel just like last time. And I, when I get back to, and in my body, I get into my body kind of with a thud. And I'm like, okay, that was weird. What if somebody had tried to wake me? What if, what if my husband or my kids had tried to wake me and all of a sudden I'm completely unresponsive? Would, you know, would they be calling, would they be calling 911? What would happen? And that kind of, that kind of made me feel weird. So, so I picked the number. This is day two. Now, day three, that night, I go to sleep. And I have the same experience again. I had it three days in a row. And this last time on day three, I end up going through the tunnel. I meet Yeshua. We pick up right where we left off. And we don't go a very long distance. We're not, we're not traversing like we were before. We weren't, you know, making a lot of a lot of headway in this field or what have you. And he stopped. And I turned and I looked at him. And I knew immediately, see, I'm going to get emotional now. <laughs> when, when I looked at him, I knew exactly that this was the last time. This was going to be the last time that I had this experience. And I, and I verbalized those words. I looked, at, I looked in his face. And I said, this is the last time, isn't it? And he smiled and kind of chuckled. And he grabbed my hands. And he said, it is. It is the last time. But you have been comforted. And it was like an explosion just went off in my, in my mind. That was my original prayer. My original prayer was that I would be comforted. And I had no idea that it was going to be anything greater than the comfort I was experiencing going into the surgery, knowing that I would be fine no matter what happened and my kids would be fine no matter what happened. But then to arrive at this 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 these three days of incredible experience in the midst of the surgery was just absolutely mind blowing. And with that, he said, "Okay, it's time to go back now." And I went back down the tunnel and got my hearing back, got my eyesight back, arrived in my body with this this thud. And again, when I woke up, I was in my own bed, and I thought, oh, my gosh, if my kids or my husband had tried to wake me, it wouldn't have happened. And, you know, what would that have looked like? Um, but it was, it was the last experience that I had, which is kind of a bummer because I've had three major surgeries since. Um and I've always asked, can I go back? <laughs> can I go back and experience that again? And it's, it has not happened. Um, but what ended up transpiring after that 
was when I went back to the church that I had become a part of and the Bible study, I was afraid to tell anybody about this because I had this feeling that it was it was going to end up being, well, you know, that wasn't from God or they were, they were going to counter it with something. But at the same time, I just couldn't keep my mouth shut because it was like I had to say something to somebody. And so I did. I told the women in the Bible study, I said, I had this experience. And sure enough, there were those that said, oh, you know, you experienced some sort of demonic thing from the devil. That was a demon. That wasn't Yeshua. And I'm like, no, it, it was him. That was that was him. And they wouldn't believe me. Um, then there were, were people that just listened and kind of smiled politely, but made sure they distanced themselves from me a lot. And so I'm like, oh, okay. So I really can't say too much. There were a couple people that were interested and were open enough to hear what I had to say without passing judgment. But for the most part, it, it was, didn't go over well. So for many, many years, I just kind of kept it in, on the back burner, didn't talk about it a whole lot. I threw myself into the entire Orthodox Christianity, the non-denominational church that I had belonged in, and I became a Bible study leader eventually. I took seminary courses. I literally threw myself into it wholeheartedly. I could never take my, my near-death or out-of-body experience, I could never take that and squish it into the confines, into the box of Christianity. It would never really fit. But I thought, well... Okay, I'm not going to think about that a whole lot. I'm, just, I'm okay. This is the path. I, you know, I met met Jesus on the other side, met Yeshua. So obviously, this is the path. And I didn't really clue in and take to heart what he said when he said, "I'm whoever anybody needs to see." I, I, I kind of just in my mind, I kind of glossed over that and thought, "Okay, well, yeah, yeah. I don't know what that means, but you know." This, the Christian path is the right one, right? And so I persisted and persisted and persisted and continued to gain more and more knowledge and study deeper and deeper. And throughout all of that, there were things that would come up and I would say, this is not right. This does not sound right. This does not look right. But I could not, I couldn't put it together. And if I tried to talk about it with people that were in the church or in my Bible study group, I got shut down immediately and told that, oh, well, you know, you're entertaining a demon if you think that's what, you know. And it just was, it was, it, it was, it was a very lonely place. So unfortunately, much to my embarrassment, I persisted in this, this faith for, for a very long time. And then in 2010, I lost my oldest son to a tragic accident. He was in a recreation area in Washington State. He had been traveling there for his business. He was with his, his company, his, uh, the business. They, he traveled a lot. And he was there, and he was in a recreation area with some friends um, two of which were, or one of which was um, somebody that he actually worked with, and they did a lot of traveling throughout the U.S. and Canada for his business. And and then two of them were, were people that were part of the same company, but they lived in Washington, they, and they all went to this recreation area. And he lost his footing near a bridge that wasn't really well constructed or safe, didn't have a guardrail where there needed to be one and he fell and he was killed and that losing him totally brought me to a, a place where 
I had to really re-examine what do I believe? Because from the time I had, quote, become a Christian, I had prayed for my children and their lives and their health and their safety every single day. And, and I know that, you know, I knew that prayer is not a magic formula for, you know, God in heaven, so to speak, to dole out, you know, safety and health and protection to the people that pray hardest or what have you. I knew that wasn't the case. But at the same time, it really kind of opened my eyes to, wait a second, you know, there was a part of me that knew even though he was only 27 years old when he lost his life, he had completed his purpose here. That became very clear to me. Something told me, Zach, Zach was finished. His purpose was finished. And, and that was very strong, very strong. And then there was one night that I was... Um, I was on the computer. I'd been talking to one of my cousins. She was being very comforting. And she had forwarded me a video. It was actually the newsreel of them recovering his body, my son's body. And it had been shown from San Diego all the way up to, to Washington. And she didn't, you know, she didn't know. Should, should I share this with you? Should I show you? Should I not? She was... And I said, absolutely, you know, I, I do, I, I want to see this. For some reason, I wanted to see it, and I did. And while I was watching the video and talking to my cousin on the phone, there were paranormal things that were happening in my house. And, I mean, they were very blatant. There was a notebook that was sitting on the top of my computer, and it literally elevated and... and fell on the floor and I'm like okay that's that's weird what is that about and then I walked from the bedroom after I got off my phone call with my cousin I walked from my bedroom into the kitchen and as I'm going down this little hallway there was a book that was in my path title side up and I'm like and I was the only one in the house and I'm like, how did that happen? It, it made no sense. And it was interesting because it was, it was one of the books from the Left Behind series. And I'm like, that is so strange. And so I took it, for me, it was like, I didn't need to really examine what, what I believe. What is in the realm here that I, I'm not addressing? And then I really started dwelling again on my, my death experience. And I came to the point where I realized that persisting in the Orthodox Christian path wasn't for me. It could be for other people, but, but it wasn't for me. And, and I needed to find out why. I needed to know why, because I'm always a, a needing the why kind of person. And so then I started studying in, in, a, in a different way. I started studying very deeply. I started going to sources that I would never have thought of going to. You know, when I was practicing this Christian faith, and I really started looking at what we have as far as writings of the Bible. And I came to the conclusion that um, there are flicks of truth in there, but there's a lot of other stuff in there that's not right. And some of it could have been purposely put in by scribes translating scriptures. Um, things have been fiddled with. And I could no longer be part of a group that said, oh, you know, every single word of scripture is God-breathed and inerrant. I, I, I could no longer go there at all. Um, although there were little bits of parts of the, of the Bible that did speak truth, and one of them actually came to mind probably in the last 
I don't know, six, eight months. Um, and it made, it made total sense to me, and, and I'll tell you what it is. Um, we live in an area where we have a ton of wildlife. We live next to a, a national forest, and we have a lot of, a ton of deer. And they're in a, this is kind of a protected area, this, the, the neighborhood that we live in. There's, there's no hunting. There's no, everybody protects the wildlife. And so we have a lot of deer that traverse through our property. And we have a hill on the back of our property, and they have their little trails, okay? They have their trails that they traverse. And I love watching them. And as I'm watching them, this one day it occurs to me, they always walk that path single file. They don't walk that, they don't walk that path side by side, okay? They always walk it single file. Even babies, the babies that are following their mamas, they walk it single file. And I'm like, why is that significant to me? And it brought to mind that scripture in the Bible. I think it's in Matthew somewhere. And it talks about following the narrow path instead of the wide path and the big gate that leads to destruction. You know, the, 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 the narrow path and the small gate is what you want. And I remember asking people about this when I was, when I was part of the, the original Bible, women's Bible study group. I remember asking them and saying, what about this, the, this path? Oh, well, the narrow path is the, the Christian faith. And I said, but that doesn't make sense to me because everybody's, everybody's like congealed together on this path trying to walk. And that's, that's, that's not narrow. That's like, that's a group. That's a large group. Oh, no, that's what it means. That's what it means. And, it, and I never, it never felt right to me. It never set well with me. So as I'm watching these deer, I'm thinking, what is the most narrow path somebody can walk? Literally, what is the most narrow path? And the narrow path is the path that you have to walk single file. You have to walk. Your own feet are the only thing that is going to fit. It's not going to be wide enough for a bunch of bunch of people. It's just going to be wide enough for you. And so I dwelled on that for a long time. And I'm like, what does that mean exactly? And during this time, I was, again, really thinking about this near-death out-of-body experience. And, and the thought came that everybody's path is unique. Everybody has their own spiritual path to walk, and it fits their feet. It doesn't mean that there's going to be, you know, 500, 1,000, million, billion, whatever. It doesn't mean that the whole group is going to be walking on this path. It means that this is meant for you. Your feet fit it. And that knowledge gave me so much comfort and I, I was I was just ecstatic it was like yeah that makes sense everybody's path is going to be unique for them and I think where we run into trouble at least where I ran into trouble was trying to make sure that my path was this rigid in a box you can only believe this you can only say this that it never worked and I tried for a very long time. I tried for a very long time to, you know, make that my path and it wasn't right. So I have since felt like this is the right thing. Each, each, each person has their own unique spiritual path to walk. And what that looks like is going to vary from person to person. And what they pull into that is going to be different from person to person. And so there's, there's, it, there it is in a nutshell. That's, that's where I've arrived after going through everything I've been through. And I find that um, I'm a lot happier. I, I am. And the, the, the spiritual connection 
Um, I, I had gifts as a kid um, growing up. I mean, there were things that would happen. I'm like, I would know what was going to happen before it happened. I just knew. I knew this was going to happen before it happened. Um, so I don't know. I mean, there was a, I had a clairvoyant thing happening when I was a kid. My mom was psychic. Um, she would be able, she could just send a message and say, give me a call. E- even as I, when I became an adult, even when I was part of the church, the Christian church, my mom would just, she would just send it out. Say, oh, I, I, give me a call. I want to talk to you. And I, I would know immediately. And so now those gifts have been multiplying exponentially and it's, it's opened a floodgate of um, experience that I, I would never have imagined, ever. But, uh, yeah, that's what happened to me. Well, thank you for sharing that. That uh, is, is fabulous. And, um, you know, again, you're not alone. Many people have had these experiences, and they're always changed. It's just like it it turns on something that can never be turned off. It also puts you in a place where this knowing that you now know, there's nothing that can shake it because you simply know. And so, yeah, you you could get people that say, oh, well, you know, you might you might burn forever. You don't want to be wrong. We're not wrong. We know, you know, once you have these type of experiences, you can't go back. You just can't go back. And, and yeah. you know, I I believe everyone need, needs them, and if they need them, they get them as however they need it. You know, like like mm-hmm. yours was individual, and you needed to see Yeshua. This is what brought you comfort, and this is mm-hmm. what you asked the universe for, and this is what the universe brought you, and it brought you comfort. So I mean, and and the time from it started into the end you were continually being comforted, just like you asked, but you didn't know, at the time of asking, I think it was really cool, you didn't know how that comfort was gonna come, but you oh, asked. I had no idea. Yeah, I, I thought that was the cool part. It's like, this is what makes life so fun. And, you know, with your with your spiritual abilities and your gifts that you're using, um, just continue to develop those. And I think this just really shows someone who, tried out the the faith the their christian faith catholic whatever and it just didn't fit but you knew that there was something real to it so that's why i wanted dawn to come on and tell her story because she fits a wide array of of the collective consciousness that's out there those who might be afraid to break out of the norm in fear of dot 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 so yeah wow there is another uh, the, the aspect of the number picking that is something that I don't have. I, I don't have a lot of memory of what that means, and I, I have asked. I have asked over the last couple of years, and there was one time when I was in a meditative state, and I'm saying, "What what was up with the number picking? What does that mean?" And what came to me was that it was. Um, Oh, it's hard to describe. Um, it had to do with 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 belief or faith, or it had to do with with um, what we're what we're willing to believe, what we're willing to explore, type of thing. And and what ended up coming is that there are going to be people in life that find their niche in Catholicism or a non-denominational Christian church or Buddhism or some, some type of religion or, you know, Orthodox or structured type of religion. They're going to find their, their spot there and they're going to be content. They're going to arrive at that and say, this is where I'm at. This is where I'm going to live my life. And they live their life there and that, that's it. That's that's as as far as they go, and the 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 perspective that I was given is that it, this is not wrong. Um, 
I think it can rob us of, of other things that we could potentially see if we didn't limit ourselves because it's going to be limiting. There's just no way around it. It's going to be limiting if, if somebody opts to say, I want to, you know, I want to experience life and live my life as a Catholic or as a born again Christian or, or what have you, it's going to bring limits with it. And for some people, it's a stepping stone. For some people, they're going to experience it and they're going to come to the end of it and know that it's not right for them. Mm -hmm. And then they may go on to something else and then they may go on to something else. And I believe that's what it was about. And for me, it was a matter of remaining teachable. In fact, that was that was my favorite saying when my kids were growing up as I would tell them, Remain, if you don't do anything else in life, remain teachable because you will have the ability to learn something if you remain teachable. If you close yourself off and say, oh, I've arrived, here I am, I'm like, right through, here it is, I know, I, know what I, I know what I know and that's all I know and I'm good with that. That's You're going to be like right through, the next step is you're going to be rotten, you're not going to be worthless. So remain teachable in all things. And so that's where, I mean, I'm sure that there's bigger, bigger things about this whole number pick thing that I went through, but that's what I've gotten so far is that I can use all the experiences that I've had as stepping stones to where I'm going, that it's ever evolving. The spirituality, my spirituality is ever evolving. And as long as I remain teachable, then that's that's what I picked. That's somehow what the number nine represents in my life. Mm -hmm. That's that's beautiful, and I think that's really a great thing to leave people with. Remain teachable. You know, keep yourself open. And mm -hmm. I, you know, I can already feel done. We've gone past an hour, so we do have to wrap it up. I can't believe we went past an hour. Um, I know that happened quick. <laughs> it did, and well, pro I I feel a part two coming on. So um, because there's so many things that I wrote down that I wanted to talk about that I think will help other people, um, but okay. I want I want to leave it here, and we're so grateful. And just hang hang here on the phone with me a minute while we wrap it up, Don. So yes. So okay, again, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dawn, and we look forward to your guys' questions, comments, and, you know, share your experiences as well, as always. Uh, this is all just, it's, it's one journey, but again, there's, there's no right or wrong path, as, as Dawn was, was alluding to. It, it's, it's up to you, you know, to, to think that one size fits all. It's never the case, never. And I couldn't agree with her more about uh, limiting ourselves. Always remain open to new revelations. And as always, guys, thanks for your support. Source bless and namaste. Namaste.